Well, Karen has it right in terms of effervescing. Um, the project I want to talk about uh, has taken us two years to do, and it is uh, very, very close to being completed. Uh, the project specifically um, has a lot of interesting aspects to it. Listen as I speak for the connections that we've made across the world, not just with other Rotary Clubs, but uh, in several countries, but also with the Ambassador of Scholar Program. Uh, the significance of this is that as a consequence of this project, uh, I made a commitment two years ago that we would find a better way of bringing back ambassador or scholars to reconnect with the Rotary Foundation and with Rotary Projects. So one of the reasons that this project was a success and was in fact started by one of the uh, ambassador or scholar alums uh, was in fact their very active participation in it. The project specifically is to supply surgical instruments for the reconstructive uh, surgery on hands, primarily on children uh, in the country of Kosovo. Kosovo is in the southeast um, of, the, of Europe. It's the poorest country in Europe. It suffered very severely just over 10 years ago with the civil war, the Balkan civil war between the Albanians and the, uh, the Albanians and the Serbs. And the outcome of that was that the United Nations finally uh, forces went in there and uh, broke up the fight. Uh, but it really left Kosovo bereft of medical services. They, basically, uh, the services were largely destroyed. So the need was uh, to try to pick a project, and it was Dr. Ghani Bazi, who is from Kosovo, uh, was an ambassador or scholar, still is with us in the proximity of Boston, and he's been working very hard on it. He says, we have a need there in the plastic surgery department of the University Clinical Center there in Pristina, Kosovo, to supply instruments to, for reconstructive hand surgery. Um, the uh, requirement is, uh, that wasn't being met at all, was on the whole to uh, cater for 250 surgeries per year. So that gave us a bit of a goal to uh, try to find the, uh, the surgical instruments that would be needed. Uh, we recognized that we would have to go for a matching grant of $35,000, which meant a major challenge to my Sturbridge Club because typically our club will go and give $1,000 towards a project like that, and we really needed to raise $10,000 to get the matching $10,000 from the district and then the, the <coughs> remaining 15000 from the foundation. The only way we could do it was to reach out to other clubs. And I'm pleased to say that uh, seven, uh, the total project has seven clubs involved. So in the United States, we have the Brookfield Club, we have the Billerica Club, we have the uh, Bedford Club and Sturbridge, of course. Then uh, Sturbridge has, uh, 25 years ago, I started a sister club relationship with the Stourbridge Club in England. That is a very active relationship that we keep going uh, all of the time. Uh, they participated, so Stourbridge in the United Kingdom participated through a second ambassador or scholar, um, uh, Joe Bernardo, who was sponsored as an ambassador or scholar by the Billerica Club, who is now, Joe is now in Turkey. Uh, he uh, was hosted by the Fenerbahce Club there and he still is in Turkey there, and it was he who in fact got the um, Fenerbahce Club to make the biggest donation of $3,000. That really kicked this thing into gear. So uh, frankly, without the, the scholarship participation, the scholar participation, we really would never have got this thing started. So we were getting uh, up towards the kind of money that we needed, the $10,000, and it was really uh, recognition that we weren't quite going to get there. Uh, in time before the whole rules were changing on the, on the, on the uh, matching grant programs. So uh, something that Ralph uh, pointed out to me a year or so ago is that there's really no reason why we can't go directly to our club members and say, by the way, we have this club uh, project. The money that you would normally give towards the foundation that would go into the annual program fund, why don't you dedicate that specifically to this project? And that did the trick. So we, uh, outside uh, the, this room there, we've got a display there which shows you exactly who gave what uh, by way of club and, and individual contributions. But the bottom line is we just about managed to scrape the money together and the project uh, got kicked off. The project then uh, met a real problem phase. We found that uh, we were dealing with uh, the, the surgeons directly. We established regular video uh, Skype uh, connections uh, with the surgeons directly in the uh, university clinical center. And we thought, well, you know, why don't we just go and ask them, what do you need? And the answer was, well, we really don't know. It took us a long time to realize that they were actually incapable of telling us what their real need was. 
So how the hell were we going to go and buy the instruments? Uh, we went a multitude of different ways, and we came to discover, perhaps 18 months into the project, that uh, there was a Swedish surgical team uh, visiting the, uh, that specific uh, uh, department in the uh, University Clinical Center. So we said, well, why don't we contact them and ask them? And to our absolute amazement, we found that this surgical team from Sweden had been going for 12 years, every six months there. And so they had obviously made a major commitment, knew very well what the needs were. So they, in fact, finally came through and defined what the, what the needs really were. And they broke down into two kinds of um, instruments. Hand instruments, meaning unpowered instruments, and those, and those that were powered either pneumatically or electrically. And we, uh, we eventually uh, found the, uh, the manufacturers, they were all made in the United States, and we have, at this point in time, all of the hand instruments were delivered some time ago, uh, three months or so ago, and I found out yesterday that the powered instruments are leaving tomorrow, uh, left yesterday. So the question then was, how do we get them there? And we made another discovery, and that was we have a retired army colonel as a member of our club, and he says, you know what, the National Guard will fly them there. Really? <laughs> um, how does that work? Well, why don't you go over to Westover base? Uh, they'll fly, they have flights directly to Kosovo. You're kidding. So uh, the answer was, well, wrong. Um, but the reality is, and I think this is something that is worth learning, the National Guard of every state uh, has adopted an underdeveloped country. It just so happened that Kosovo was adopted by the Iowa National Guard. <coughs> you, I'm sorry, I choke up with it, but you cannot imagine the phenomenal support that we had from the Iowa National Guard. They hand carried, the, the, the soldiers carried those instruments, delivered them by hand. The, the other issue was, well, okay, so now you've got the, uh, that was $6,000 worth. We, we worked very hard with the, the manufacturers, and they gave us great prices on them. So we weren't paying the full price anyway. So we worked very well also with the, another company, um, MicroAir in Virginia, and they too gave us absolutely superb prices uh, on the power tools. So we sent both pneumatic as well as uh, uh, electrically driven devices. We're talking drill is that the only way that we could in fact go and uh, have the two-year uh, warranty honored by the manufacturers, in fact, by going through the exclusive agent there. Bottom line is we did all of that. Uh, the stuff is on, finally on its way there. This should be being delivered in just over a week's time. Um, but uh, we, in the process, we really hit one major, major uh, snag that I think may be a uh, cause for thought. Uh, when we uh, were granted the uh, matching grant, um, we said, fine, you've got $35,000, we're very really happy about it. And they said, oh no, you haven't. That money will only be sent to you provided that you meet the OFAC requirements. Okay, what's OFAC? OFAC is the Office of Foreign Assets Control. It's a federal government agency. It is the watchdog that makes sure that we don't go and ship either money or any equipment to any country that, where there's terrorist action. Guess what? Kosovo is on that list. So that meant that we had to uh, supply to OFAC uh, information about what we were shipping, where we were buying it from, how much it was cost, how it was being shipped, uh, where it was going to, and we couldn't do that because at that point in time, and here we're talking about uh, right at the start of the project when the, when the project had been granted, and we were expecting to receive the money from the foundation, and they said, no, no go. And at that point, we really didn't even know what we were buying. Um, so the, the issue eventually got settled, that, and it was pure luck, that uh, almost a year ago, uh, OFAC uh, released Kosovo as one of the countries, so we no longer had to meet that requirement. And so we did get the money, that, and, the, and only at that point did the, the project really kick in. So from the point of view of being able to supply equipment to other countries, uh, it's a watch out, to check on it. It's, you, know, you can look these countries up directly on the internet, and you'll get to know. But the bottom line is, um, we, we learned a lot of things. We learned that the Iowa National Guard, the National Guard in general, can be extraordinarily helpful. Uh, we learned that you can negotiate with companies when you're buying new equipment as to what the price really is. Uh, we learned really that um, the connections that you can have with ambassadorial scholars and so on can be tremendously helpful. 
So let me simply say that uh, a result of um, the activities that we, uh, and the participation and the things that we learned from this project, and something of what we'd known before is that we have now, uh, just two weeks ago, chartered the, uh, the Rotary Alumni Association of Greater New England, which is an electronic um, uh, alumni association, in other words, ambassador of scholars, GSE team members, team leaders, anybody who has ever participated in the Rotary Foundation program can become a member. It's e-based, meaning that it's like a, like a Rotary e-club. Uh, we have an excess of 120 members at this point in time. So we're building a huge network of uh, people who will have uh, not only financial resources, but also uh, real skill sets and knowledge of the different countries. Because in, the, um, in that, data, in that uh, membership list are, people, are all of the people who ever came through what's called Northeast Link, which is our regional orientation for ambassadors, scholars, that we've run the last 15 years. So we have really, if you like, uh, detailed information from many parts of the world where the scholars came from, subsequently went back, probably moved around a lot, but we are uh, working very hard and really reconnecting the alumni of the Rotary Foundation program such that they can participate in our Rotary projects as indeed these two did. The converse is also true that um, they are now uh, starting to think in terms of projects that they will do themselves and they will be asking, well, who among the Rotarians has the expertise to help them uh, execute their particular projects? So I think I'm, I'm very excited about it. The connections that we've made, the connections between the clubs, you know, clubs in England and in the States and Turkey and Kosovo, I think it's tremendous. And I think uh, it's clearly the way to go in, in order to, to really get projects done. So 